Gucci, Gabriel Nassif. That's Italy on the top. That's France on the bottom. And they are faced off and ready to go. I know the card that I'm looking for here from Gucci's side is the big pig Yasharn. And so far, I don't see one in sight here. And in fact, is that even a keep from Gucci? That's a slow one, isn't it, Said I'm sending that back. I mean, we got yeah. the lands there, the battlefield tapped, fabled passages, and we're going to enter the battlefield untapped for sure at this point. Uh, these hydroid crises are way too small. Like, just no thank you. We can do a lot better than this. So we'll see if those ones go back. Now, on the other side is Gabriel Nassif taking a look at his opening hand. And while he's got to be happy with the spells, land count's a little low there, just a blood crypt. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think we're going to see a mulligan here on, on both sides. But mm -hmm. at least that's what I would lean towards, especially yeah. with the London mulligan rule being a thing. But mm -hmm. uh, as you and I are certainly used to, Nassif is just going in already. Oh, yes. Yeah. Time to dive into the tank. All right. Ooh, he did ship it back. Ultimately, uh, Nasif is going to be on the play here for this match, and he's kept this. It's going to be a six card hand with four lands and two three drops. Mayhem Devil Woe Strider now on the top. Manguchi did end up shipping that hand back, that really slow hand as well. But he's got a pretty decent one here with Essence Scatter. Thoughtseize in a Hydrate Crisis. Another Thoughtseize joins the party here as well. And that means that Nassif's going to be on basically zero unless he draws a one or a two drop right here, and he didn't. So his hand is just going to be on empty here. Yeah, his hand's not particularly good. You mentioned the second copy of Thought Says that Manguchi did draw. Curious if he wants to fire that off right now or if he just wants to leave up Essence Scatter. Scatter would take care of the devil. Then you can Thought Says your opponent on the following turn and the off chance they drew a card like Collected Company. I am from the future. <laughs> future Cedric strikes again. Now, Gabriel Nassif, of course, knows what's up here as far as the possibilities for ways for Manguchi to interact with the Mayhem Devil on the stack. The question becomes... Can he do anything about it? Is it? Is there a world where he just says, yeah, I'm just not going to do anything, but also he can pull ahead and win the game? Seems tough. Does seem tough. We're going to see how Nassif does elect to play this out. And one thing that I do want to mention about Nassif is, as you were going over his accolades to lead into this match, I, I got to say, it is pretty uh, it is pretty telling that he's basically taken the Finkel route of two careers. Like, we have, we have like, Nassif's career and, like, the like the 2000s, and now we have like this version of Nassif's career too, and, and both are just completely absurd. I mean, he's just unreal. He really is, yeah. You could make an argument that Finkel went for the four-career route, or three-career route, I should say. He's got sure. enough for about three Hall of Fame careers, but Nassif's well above two at this point as well. Interestingly, you can see why. He just played around it, right? There's one essence scatter in the list here for, for Manguchi, and he's just like, yep, not going to play into it. I'm just going to pay the three for the Gigant of the Wellspring and then pass the turn back over. Now we see the uh, thought sees there for Manguchi to take away <clears throat> the collected company, and that means that the essence scatter is left over now with the mana to cast it for the Mayhem Devil. So... Manguchi doing very well here, even with Gabriel Nassif's best efforts to try to uh, play around what he's presenting. There's going to be a growth spiral here into a breeding pool. And then the Manguchi is just going to pass the turn with eliminate available. Yeah, Manguchi would love to draw a land that enters the battlefield untapped next turn so he can play Crisis for two. However, we got a big 5-5 companion coming on down here. We don't see this a ton. I know people don't love this card in Gigantha, but it actually does do some stuff, and we're going to see it probably get in for at least 5, maybe even 10 points of damage this game. Wow. A f this, this feels exceedingly fair, but it is likely to just start smashing, as you said, said it is going to get in there. Now the Eliminate will take care of the Dreadhorde Butcher here before that plus one, plus one counter ever reaches it, meaning that it's only going to get in for the one damage here. But Gigantha smashing in here for five, and Manguchi is going to be looking to get Nissa who shakes the world into Hydroid Crisis to help come back. I'm curious to see if there's enough time for that here, as we can see. Nassif applying big pressure. He has eight power on the battlefield right now, and Manguchi is already down to 11. You know, it looks right. like it's going to be Uro time. Enough cards in the graveyard to be a, to be able to escape the incredibly powerful 6-6 six, six and have this loom over the battlefield. So now, if you're Manguchi, you're trying to fade a 
claim the firstborn. You know your opponent has no cards in hand and just has a wolf strider in the graveyard. So uh, let's see if you could sacrifice this goat token uh, at some point here and try to find a claim or at least increase his chances of finding one to be able to put a close uh, on this game or at least something close to a close. That would be a good close. game, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, it would actually be. would be exactly 14. So. Yeah. So let's see if Manguchi can find that claim the firstborn. It's not off of this, or excuse me, if Nasif can. And no, he did not. He scried a land to the bottom and found Dread Horde Butcher. And now he's facing down, well, the thing that it basically every player has to face down if you play much historic, which is an Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath sitting across from you, acting as both a stop sign for any attacks as well as. Uh, something that's going to be sent into the red zone, offer trades, and generate value while doing so. Nassif's going over his options. Is there a world where he just wants to attack with all of his creatures, assuming Gigantha the Wellspring gets blocked? He would get in for five, but then he would be taking three, or excuse me, uh, Mingachu would be gaining three on the crackback. Boy, it looks pretty rough here. And this kind of scenario to highlight why I love Martin Yuza's build of Gruul, this kind of scenario happens a lot for aggressive strategies, right? We've seen this really since Uro's inception of, okay, so I've got some creatures, but you just got an Uro back and like, I can't attack, right? Because it's a 6-6. Six, six. So sure, I could send in all three creatures, right? And it's okay, block your Jingatha, you'll sacrifice before damage to get a Scribe through Woe Strider, and then I'll take four points of damage. You got a 3-2 Dreadhorde, you got a 3-2 Woe Strider and a 2-2 two, two Dreadhorde Butcher. Cool, I can beat that stuff, right? Because I have Uro, gain a life, draw a card, everything else. So that's where a card like Oncrab Crasher has been so good for Martin this weekend of, dude, nice Uro, that can't block and take a whole bunch of damage. Uh, that's why I love that build of his deck. But unfortunately for Nassif, no copies of Oncrab Crasher in that 75. Yes, this is a perfect scenario to illustrate that point, Cedric. It's just this happens all the time, that mm -hmm. Uro is just the stop sign. Yet, if you are able to get even one good attack step past it, the game's often just over, and you could ignore it. But, you know, Uro's so good and so difficult to handle that that's the kind of uh, lengths that people have gone to is is actually alternating their builds just to try to get this one critical turn worth of damage in. And right now, Nasif is really thinking over all of the options as he thinks about, okay... What am I going to do uh, after if, if I don't attack here? Do I have a chance to win? And it looks like Nassif has decided I'm just going to have to deal with it. I don't have a good route to victory if I go for the all-in attack. So he's going to pass the turn back. It was an island off the top of the library there for Mengu. And if you're Mangu, that's you know that's best case scenario right there. That that is your creature cannot attack me. Now I get to decide if I want to do any attacking with Uro or not. I've got a Nissa. I can play a Hydroid Crisis as a one, two, three, four, five. So as a six, six flyer and draw a couple of cards. There is always this fear in the back of your head from Manguchi about if my opponent finds a claim the firstborn, what does that look like? If my opponent finds a collected company, what are their best hits? But Ignoring that, it, it's pretty hard to not do this, which is attack with Uro, when you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, almost for sure, Nassif also considering whether just attacking with Gigantha last turn had any merit, as if it were to get blocked, then the Dreadhorde Butcher could be sacrificed after that to do the final damage to it. And I think that Nassif decided that if it were not blocked, that would be too big of a liability here as he really does need to do everything he can to get Uro off the battlefield. And as you can see, he's going to go for the double block. And I have to say, I'm <laughs> kind of impressive that Gigantha just being a 5-5 five -five is just really big for this format. <laughs> you, know, you don't often see creatures quite that big outside of the, the heavy hitters like Uro and and the five drops and stuff, and uh, it's actually just working out well here as it's going to trade off for for the Titan. Yeah, I mean, er, um, excuse me, Jonathan's just kind of an interesting card in so far as there's nothing exciting about it. You know, it, it's it's mostly free as a companion in this style of deck. There are some trade-offs given the text on Gigantha, but, you know, how many games does that card win? I don't know, one in every 30 or 40 or something, but guess what? That's good enough. Uh, and how many times does a situation come up like this where, you, you had Gigantha, and you were able to double block, and yeah, you lose it, but you were able to get that Ur off the battlefield. How often does that come up? Not that much, but for right now, it mattered. And so that's actually pretty nice about that card. Ooh, speaking of go. good cards. Wow, okay, here's one of the few ways that Nassif could perhaps get back into this game, mm -hmm. and that is not going to do it. A second Woe Strider is a fine magic card, but when you cast Collected Company, 
you really need to hit at least two things and hopefully two good things. He hit one good thing, and that's probably not going to be enough here, especially given that that was really the window. Uh, you know, just the one creature back, no mana available for Manguchi, who just cast that crisis. as a 4 4, so he got a couple of extra cards in hand, plus his draw step's going to be on the way. And you got to feel like if you're Nassif, this one's really started to fall apart on you. And this is part of the, I would use the term and the word problem. Pretty loosely here, it's just a reality of this Jun Sacrifice deck, and so far as it's 25 creatures, it has been for a very long time, along with the 12 spells that it plays, 4 Claim the Firstborn, 4 Companies, 4 Witches Ovens, and then the lands, and you really can't change very much about that, which means that you are not the best Collected Company deck. You do have some very high leverage Collected Company hits, Mayhem Devils, Woe Striders in certain situations, Dreadhorde Butchers in certain situations, stuff like that. We can't forget about Midnight Reaper as well, but Hitting just one creature with Collective Company or just kind of like a, oh, I hit a Cauldron Familiar and a Dreadhorde Butcher. Like, that happens a lot with this deck. Well, now Andrea has the absolute luxury of having a ton of extra mana available. Although in this case, I guess it's not a ton of extra, but it's still, it is a lot. And uh, Nissa, who shakes the world, doubling up mana on, it looks like, three of Manguchi's lands here, plus the untappability in there as well. He's going to kick things off by just cycling. He's fine. Eliminate. He's also got Thoughtseize, another Thoughtseize, and a Nissa in hand as well. Though it looks like Nassif has no hand to speak of, so the Thoughtseize is not doing a whole lot. Not sure how Nassif is going to manage to get out of this mess. Manguchi's all the way back up to 19, has two nice creatures on the battlefield, plus a Nissa, another land to get animated this turn still, plus a removal spell and a backup Nissa. Things not looking good here for uh, for the French Hall of Famer, Gabriel Nassif. And don't forget, there's also that Uro that's in the graveyard that's looming that is just going to naturally work itself back into this game because as you just play a general game of Magic, players are going to exchange resources, cards are going to go to graveyards, and eventually there will be five cards in the graveyard for Uro to snack on so that it can get back onto the battlefield. So uh, you highlighted all of the problems that Nassif is having in this particular game, and you do get to a point against Saltai or for color in this instance where you, most of your draw steps end up not mattering anymore because they've already established too big of an advantage with Nissa, Uro, and a Hydroid Crisis. And I guess we can't forget, too, Menguchi is always drawing towards Yasharn, whereas a lot of these decks are Saltai. He's four colors, so even look though it this. doesn't look like he, he doesn't have a white source, Thought he's targeting himself. Said yeah. He just wants to put two cards in the graveyard Really heads up play here from Manguchi. He could use a Thoughtseize to get rid of another Thoughtseize. Remember, Nassif's on nothing and you in no cards in hand. So those Thoughtseizes are more or less dead at this point. And that means that uh, a clever play here from Manguchi is going to allow him to get enough cards in the yard in conjunction with the Eliminate there to flashback. I always call it flashback for short, to escape Uro from the graveyard. This is the type of high level play that we came here to see, said. Absolutely. And now it's uh, starting to be a runaway here. That uh, that Fabled Pass is actually kind of nice, too, because I think the one thing that Mengu was missing to really, really put a cap on this game was a white source of mana um, because he is four colors. So that means if he is able to draw a copy of your Sharn, that's taken care of now, too, with regards to being able to cast that. So uh, all roads look like they're leading to victory here for the uh, the master of Menguche cuisine. Yeah, it looks like he's not stopped his mastery there. Uh, <laughs> he uh, he seems to be right in his wheelhouse. You know, the types of decks that Menguche's had the most success with, and he's had a lot of success over the last couple of years, um, have been mid-range decks like this. He yeah. absolutely excels at managing the resources and the timing and everything that you need to really be good with these type of decks. It just seems to fit his approach to magic perfectly. And those type of decks have more or less been very good in many different formats for the last few years. It feels like that's kind of where things have settled on. Hey, you know, maybe we don't want pure combo decks to be the best deck for very long, right? Maybe we don't want always mono red to be crushing everything. And a lot of that has led to these two or three color mid range decks that Manguchi is just amazing at. And he is pretty darn good at them. I a hundred percent agree with you. 
Um, I had the benefit and the pleasure of having the opportunity to test with him and Brad Nelson for that Zendikar Rising Championship where we all played um, four-color mid-range and really getting the opportunity to pick his brain about how he approaches matchups and how he uh, how he builds his mana bases for this kind of deck because you do have a lot of options. It was pretty enlightening for me, uh, someone mm. who's been playing Magic for a really long time of just, oh, okay, he's, he kind of approaches things this certain way, uh, approaches like this matchup a specific way. Um, it was good. It was a really good learning experience. Yeah, these are two these are two really great ambassadors for the game as well. If you ever pop in on Gabriel Nassif's stream, you get to see one of the best players in the world play. He's also a friendly, humble guy and just a, a nice person to hang out with and be around. And that's always something great to see. And then, you know, if if you pop in on Mangucci, you'll it's hard to find somebody that is more passionate about the game than he is. I, you know, this is a guy who on the weekend is playing legacy at some shop or something. He's got a cube that he maintains. He has an extensive collection of magic cards going back all the way to the earliest days where he has these beautiful versions that he, he gets, he loves to play most formats. And he also happens to be an extremely good high level player. It's just, uh, it's hard to find somebody who's more into all aspects of the game than, than Andre Mangucci. It's always a pleasure to see him doing well. Yeah, he he enjoys playing basically every format, loves cube, loves everything. It seems like every night when I am a head in a bed is when his stream is really getting rolling. Uh, and he's like, I'm doing this thing today. I'm doing this thing today. And it always feels like it's something brand new. Um, like even like the French formats that exist on Arena or Magic Online. And he just, uh, he came to game, as we like to say in this community. He, he did. That's a good way to put it, Seth. <laughs> Andrea Mangucci is one of the most I came to game players I've ever met. And, you know, there is a tendency when players reach the absolute peak of a game like like uh, Mangucci has for Magic to um, really only focus on the things that matter in respects to that, right? Uh, you know, you'll talk to a lot of pro players and you'll say, well, you, you did a bunch of Vintage Cube when it was on Magic Online, right? And they'll be like, no, like I was testing for standard. I have a tournament coming up, right? And, and if it's not relevant to their next tournament, they don't really, they don't have the, the bandwidth for it. But, uh, you know, and that makes sense, right? They're professional players, and so they have to put their focus in certain places to make sure that they stay at their uh, peak. But Andrea Mangucci seems to have time for all of it and, <laughs> like, amazing carbonara dinners every other night, too. That's why I'm friends with him. <laughs> you, know, you know, I make a pretty good carbonara, said. That's why I'm friends with you. Yeah, yeah. When this is over, I'll have that's to come new and in, that's new information. But yeah, mm -hmm. we'll keep this friendship going. Yeah, I think even Mangucci would be impressed by mine, though. That I might not. Bold. I I, Bold. I make it like how they make it in Rome, man. I I really like took some time. I tried some different recipes. I know what I'm doing with it. I'm gonna say uh, as we're now we're on carbonara talk. I made my first one. Mm -hmm. Three weeks ago, oh. I purposely I purposely was not learning uh, due to uh, just not wanting to become enormous because I love pasta. So I finally <laughs> made, I finally did my you know, people are doing like pandemic sourdough breads or whatever nonsense like bacon breads. No, I'm, I'm in the pasta game. I've just been learning different types of pasta, bacon, homemade carbonara. It's a lot of trouble because it is way too good. Oh, I didn't use bacon. No, what would you use? Pancetta, that's not hopefully? What, yeah, that's not what goes yeah. in the in the yeah, real carbon. Also, yeah. deeply yeah. offended, oh. deeply offended by chat that says, I'm sure you're using creme fraiche. Also, they spelled creme fraiche wrong, which was another further offense. And of course, we got to get I'm, a ban. We got to get a ban in there. Of we gotta, course, I'm not using creme fraiche. That is time really out. unkind. Yeah, I time. Uh, All right, I got a heart. From we we can we can spare them. They gave me a heart in chat, so I'm, okay. I'm I I just melt whenever anybody does that. So no no band needed, but yeah. There we go. See, uh, Squeed four twenty is the only one who actually answered correctly. It's guanciale that you put in carbonara, and I actually went down to a specialist place to buy some. Jeez. That stuff is strong. <laughs> it is no joke. I have made it with bacon too. It tastes awesome. So it looks like Nassif finally found a copy of Claim the Firstborn, taking Uro. We're giving some beatdowns to this Nissa that's hanging out on eight. Nassif's going to get the opportunity to draw a card um, with the Uro attack. Also, by sacking the Uro, 
to Wo Strider, you're also going to get the opportunity, and there's another claim the first one. You're also going to get the opportunity to scry and draw a card via Midnight Reaper. Yes, we know there are things going on with the game, but Carbonara conversation will not wait oh, for I, any human. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure Mangucci would. I'm sure Mangucci would actually appreciate what's happening here. Oh, he would, and I'm probably going to see if too. I mean, I the Chief's not going to win this, right? Like. I mean, it's in play. Is it I, in I play? Think it's un- Is it possible? I think it's extre- I think it's extremely unlikely. But there are a couple of uh, there are like a couple of runner runners here, draw steps, and he does have a pretty good grip on his draw step. Uh, in so far as like between the Woe Strider Scries and Midnight Reaper, like he's gonna be able to generally find what he's looking for instead of just like I have to draw a card and hope it's the best possible thing. He's got a pretty good grip on it. And now with Witches Oven alongside Cauldron Familiars in the Graveyard, like this game's getting a little more interesting than it was pre-Carbonara conversation. All right, then I'm going to set aside the pasta dish here for a minute because if you're telling me we actually have a chance and I'm back in it and look at this, Gabriel Nassif, as usual, completely methodically working his way through and has he actually given himself a chance? I see that Nissa is on eight that is the ultimate range there for Nissa. So we've seen this happen before where Nissa ultimates, then another Nissa hits the battlefield, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of indestructible three threes. How in the world is Nassif going to get through that? Well, we see the Cauldron Familiar combo as a way to get through for damage, as well as a bunch of cards potentially here off of the Reaper. But it could be a tall order if Manguchi can gain any life here. So I will say that, you know, Mangucci's found these couple, uh, well, he's found a copy of Tales End. He's ultimate, he's ultimating Nissa, all the lands are out of the deck, floated mana so that he can now play a Nissa. So here comes that. I mentioned that he is four color and not Sultai. Uh, and what, uh, you know, a couple of minutes ago, it felt like Mangucci was pretty far ahead. Uh, but the only thing he was really missing was a Yasharn, which the Sultai decks obviously don't have access to, or a really, really, really big Hydro Crisis to kind of win in the air and hoping your opponent doesn't find claim the firstborn. Well, things are getting kind of interesting because, yeah, you know, Mangucci's got this, hey, my lands are indestructible, I can just attack with these however I want to, play another copy of Nissa, blah, 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 get back this Uro, stuff like that. So it's not like I think Mangucci's doing poorly, but I will say, Nassif is building a house of cards that matters that Mangucci needs to get rid of here pretty soon, I would say. And Eliminate's not a bad place to start. Yeah, some really cool plays there while we were um, doing a little kitchen talk. Tails End actually hit a trigger from a butcher. That's what allowed Andrea Mangucci to get this Nissa who shakes the world uh, ultimate to happen. And now that we've seen it, it is going to be difficult for Nassif to actually get through here. These lands have indestructible, and they're also creatures. Uh, there's an eliminate to take out a key card here. The Midnight Reaper is currently the best way that Nassif has to keep the cards flowing into hand. As you can see, his hand looks decent here, though. He does have Priest of Forgotten Gods and Claim the Firstborn. Um, you know, sometimes you could see a world where he could whittle down the board of his opponent over time, but it seems like as long as there's Nissa in the equation, it is just going to be too difficult for Nassif to, to fully take over the board, and I'm not sure where that leaves him here after this. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Now, one one thing I will note, though, however, is that Nassif's, uh, Nassif's lands and such are tapped. Mm-hmm. Like, so his attack, his lands are tapped, his Hydro Crisis is tapped, and there is a very clear something that is not untapped, and that is Uro. So the claim the firstborn that's in his hand, you know, take your Uro. Your Uro gets to come. The Uro gets to come in and not get chump blocked or anything like that, uh, okay. which is important because it's dealing six somewhere. Hmm. So this this could be a really really nice turn for Nasif. You already see he's 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 got the claim like just lined up. He's like I'm starting there. Now I don't know what else he's going to do this turn, but I actually think Manguchi's in trouble now. No way. And I was, and I was, not, thinking, I was not thinking that five minutes ago. You know, you don't need to panic here, said. Manguchi is doing just fine. Okay. Okay. You got to trust me here. It's it's okay. Are you from Indestructible the lands. Mm, no, I'm not going to go that far. That's your... <laughs> That's <laughs> Plus, you would know already. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> Look at us. We're doing some. We're, we're thinking about doing some sacking. We got another oven here. 
I mean, do do I think? Okay, so let me count six, eleven. All right, so do I think that Manguchi dies this turn? No. Do I think that Nasif gets some good work done in this turn? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, it does look like uh, Uro's set to take out Nissa now. Unfortunately for Nasif, there is another Nissa. And, uh, you know, Nassif does have to be careful of his life total as well. He's down to 12 here. He's mm -hmm. going to be facing quite a bit of power coming across. Also, you know, one thing that we should note here that while Nassif's the one with the card draw engine going thanks to that replacement Midnight Reaper we see on the battlefield, you know, Manguchi did just take all the force out of his library. His, his library is threat dense, as we say in comparison to before that uh, ultimate went off. So he does have a better chance of drawing gas here just with his draw step. And he's not going to need a whole lot to really kind of go over the top here, especially with the Nissa available. This has been a really nice opening game here between these two great players. I've been looking forward to seeing this match all day, and this is exactly why uh, nobody's given up here. Ooh, Mythos of Nethroy here, although there's already two Witches of it seems, so perhaps just a Midnight Reaper. At any rate, um, was really looking forward to these two players going at it because of their play style. They're both excellent. I've seen them both win games that did not look winnable, uh, you know, where perhaps the conversation drifted to non-magic topics, for example. Uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, one of them is able to scrap their way back in and actually win the game. Um, I love watching players like that. Th those are some of my favorite types of players to watch are the ones that are going to scrap it out and never give up. Um, you know, Kai Bude comes to mind. Reed Duke is like that as well, where they just keep playing and making good decisions and formulating a game plan. And yeah, it doesn't happen that often, but there's a lot of people that just give up even at the high levels. They're just like, yeah, this isn't going very well. I'm probably not going to come back. I'm just going to call it. And here we get to see that where Nassif has put himself in a position to be relevant this game where it didn't look like that was going to be the case, particularly after the Nissa went ultimate. Now, can he actually make the full comeback? Well, that's yet to be seen. Never give up. Never surrender, especially with where, with how much is on the line here for these MPL matches, every single one counting. Yeah, I mean, is the likelihood to see if wins this game pretty low? I mean, five minutes ago, I would have said yes. Uh, 30 seconds ago, I'd say, hey, it looks better than it did five minutes ago. What's mm -hmm. it going to look like in two minutes? I don't know, but he's battling. He is in there, and the type of engines that this deck can put up are very difficult for lists like what Manguchi has to actually get through, uh, tons of cards going into hand from the Midnight Reapers, uh, Midnight Reaper, as well as a lot of life gain coming back at you from the Cauldron Familiars with the double ovens. There is a lot going on here for Nassif, no doubt about it. But Manguchi is able to apply a heck of a lot of pressure with these lands. Remember, they're indestructible. And that is just, that is a problem that at least as things sit is not going away. Now, that has to be one of the key cards there for Nasif, though. A mayhem devil. devil. Yeah. Yeah. He finally found one. Of course, his deck plays four, like most sacrifice decks do. Um, but yeah, to finally find one of those, it feels like it took him forever. It um, really does found... now that you mention it. My goodness. Remember, this is the same game, too, that Nassif had, like, that awful collected company where he just found one creature. And in since then, he's been able to find, you know, a couple copies of Witch's Oven, um, has resolved a couple copies of Claim the Firstborn, got some Culture Familiars rocking and rolling, Midnight Reaper, Woe Strider, on and on and on. This is going to be a mythos to take care of that priest. Now, what gets interesting here is that if we find another copy of Mayhem Devil with these scries... Claim Ooh. the firstborn. Oh, boy. Ooh. Yeah, that's a Ooh. snap. Okay, I actually think Nassif is going to win. Okay, so that was claim the firstborn born into hand off the Reaper and now scry devil to the top? Yeah. That has I, to be perfect, perfect there for Nassif. I actually think Nassif is going to win because he's got cats in the graveyard along with these ovens. Um, ooh, can we cast? Oh, can, can, can he cast it? 
Oh no, he's putting on his <laughs> boar hat. The boar hat's coming out for Andrea Mangucci because he just found the big pig. And look at this scene. He can only laugh. Boy, he actually felt like he might be winning this at that point. There we go. This is so I said this, I kind of foreshadowed this a little bit earlier because I'm from the future. I was like, I was like, Mangucci has like everything he needs but the pig. And he needs the pig to like lock Nassif out because Nassif has no way of getting it off the battlefield. And he finally found the big pig and the hat is out. Incredible there by Mangucci. Both players finding what they need to lock up the game. Unfortunately for Nassif, he found it on Mangucci's turn due to triggers from his Midnight Reaper and has yet to be able to deploy the now double Mayhem Devil that he found before Yasharn hit the battlefield as the last card out of hand for Mangucci. And look at Mangucci. He's playing it cool, but he's probably thinking, whoa, like I might have just lost this game that very turn. And the thing is, once... Yasharn's on the battlefield. It ain't leaving the battlefield unless Manguchi makes some sort of error in my estimation. And I just do not expect a player of his caliber to make that error that we're I mean, talking just about here. No way for him to get it off the battlefield, right? No, that thing should not get involved in blocking. I don't think there might be some sort of weird way. Um, <laughs> But like, yeah, I just don't think I don't think that thing should be involved in in, in blocking at all. Uh, it's just like it's basically a four four enchantment. It's just like, what's up? I got a lot of text. I'm just going to hang out here. Now, let's see. We're doing some. How do we do some sacrificing? What am I missing? Well, he gets for two. What is the plan here? How do we deal with the other two? Because he could sack a land. Right. Oh, a third mayhem devil, but he doesn't have a way to get the last two on the Yasharn and the sea yeah. has to scoop him up. And Yasharn, the big pig defended the realm there for Andrea Mangucci and earned him game number one in an absolute nail biter down the finish there. Incredible. Pretty unreal. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Pretty unreal. So if you're wondering why to splash white, that's exactly why. Um, right. It's because you want to get yourself a huge edge in the sacrifice mirror, and it is incredibly, incredibly, almost impossible. Um, I, I, I would go as far to say impossible for Yasharn to be removed from the battlefield in game number one. You know, unless you have to get into combat with it and do some blocking with it, uh, something like that. But yeah, I mean, it basically lives as this 4-4 four, four that's unkillable. Now, after sideboard, things are going to change. Um, and I remember for that Zendikar Rising Championship that players had a lot of different ways to kill Yashar. And they had access to Chandra, Torch of Defiance, Noxious Grasp. Just like the players that were playing Sacrifice Strategies went a, went like out through a big time process of like, I have to be able to beat Yasharn. As the format has shifted here, Marshall, to a lot of players playing Salty and not playing Four Color, the onus on having to kill Yasharn has lessened. So as you take a look and you see Cyborg, two Noxious Grasp. That's really about it. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, that is going to be a key card here. And uh, boy, another development having formed here, as is often the case, is Nasif's up against the clock here, too, said... He had approximately 10 minutes left on his clock as we came out of game number one there. And now he's in the unenviable position of needing to win two games against Andrea Mangucci, which is already tough enough. And he's going to have 10 ish minutes to do it. Oh, well, this is a classic. What would it be if you and I were covering a match like this and the clock does not get involved? I mean, It'd be like the Twilight Zone. I don't even understand. I can't even fathom such a thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm ahead of it. Like, I saw who we were covering. This is our pre-lunch match. I'm like, I'm having a snack. <laughs> I'm not risking it. I've got, I've got Chipotle dialed up post, uh, post match here. So. Yeah, absolutely. I know what's happening here. So, just under ten minutes here for Nasif. We'll keep an eye on it. 
Hopefully that doesn't end up being uh, uh, an issue for Nassif. Nassif knows how to navigate these situations well, though, so I doubt it will be. But that was a particularly long game one, and, and it is worth noting here as, uh, yeah, he doesn't have that much clock left. That was a fun game one. So yeah. Ley Line of the Void is how we're going to kick off game number two. Um, not a card that we've seen a ton of in Historic lately, um, but we've seen a couple players actually have Ley Lines in their sideboard here. So obviously a very impactful card in this matchup, but I, uh, but this deck can just kind of win through combat and do some other things. So let's see how this shapes up. So this shuts off some triggers, like when things go to the to the graveyard, then those won't trigger, but any sacrifice triggers will still go. Is that correct? That sounds mostly correct to me. Mm -hmm. All right. A good little start here for Nassif. He's got Priest of Forgotten Gods into Woe Strider. So if there's a single creature on the battlefield next turn, which it doesn't look like there's going to be as Uro is just going to be played from hand here. Well, then Nassif already has the answer. But uh, as it stands, it looks like he can just start beating down perhaps. I like beatdowns. I'm pro beatdowns. Very reactive hand here for Manguchi with that Leyline pregame action. And now we've got double extinction event growth spiral in hand as well. So he's looking to answer the threats on the battlefield. And he's probably going to be pretty happy to see that sep second copy of Woe Strider hit, though it looks like we're going to see some sacrificial goats here. Indeed. And we're going to follow up with the Mayhem Devil and just hope there's no Sweeper. Boy. That's, <laughs> I don't know if you caught it there, but Nassif kind of looked to the side, put his mouse down, adjusted the headset, because this is a big, big decision point. If he runs out the Mayhem Devil and his opponent has an extinction event, it is a disaster. <clears throat> it's not good. I mean, he would just lose most of his board three out of the four creatures for no real big effect and that could be very bad for Nassif especially given that his draw hasn't really backed him up here he's just got a couple of lands but he decides I need to go all in as it were cast the mayhem devil put it on the stack and pass the turn back over mm, to Manguchi who's got to be thrilled to see Yasharn and that can follow it up. And a head shake from Nassif. I mean, he knew this was a possibility. This is just something that he really, really, really didn't want to see. And in spots like this, under normal circumstances, right, you can sacrifice the creatures that are going to die to Extinction Event and say, okay, well, this isn't great for me. But at the very least, you know, I've got my Wolf Striders in the graveyard, can escape those, blah, blah, blah. The reality of the situation, as we know, is with Leyland of the Void on the battlefield, those Wolf Striders and this Mayhem Devil are gone for good. And... If you sacrifice everything right now with the extinction event on the stack, then Manguchi will just go, all right, I'll name evens. Get mm -hmm. your priest of forgotten gods out of here too. So you gotta you kind of gotta leave one of these things out here. Um and so yeah, we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a woe strider out that's gonna get uh, I presume swept away here. Yeah, Indeed. that's exactly what happens here. There's good news for Nassif, his clock's not gonna be relevant. <laughs> Some bad well, hang news on that there, comes folks. with it. <laughs> it could be Gigantha time. That's true. Gigantha tax being paid. Nassif has to pass the turn back, but now he's kind of on cruise control here in game two because Andrea Manguchi is about to play the biggest of piglies here. Yasharn Implacable Earth is going to hit the battlefield most likely this turn. And if that's the case, given what Gabriel Nassif has in hand, it's kind of Gigantha or bus. Now it does get a little bit interesting here, given that there's a priest on the battlefield. But uh, yeah, this this just doesn't look like it's going to be overcomable unless Nasif gets very lucky and finds one of his removal spells. Yeah, now you aren't on the battlefield, and Nasif's outs have dwindled significantly. So in order for him to try to win this game, he's going to need to find a way to get rid of Yasharn, and then on top of that. He's going to need to to find a way to actually push through for enough damage. And right now, all of his hopes lie with Gigantha the Wellspring, which is a 5-5. Five five. Yeah. Yasharn is like two hate bears in one. and just it's, ev uh, it's everything. It's just dominating the board here. And now we see Witch's Vengeance and a redundant Leyline of the Void go into hand. 
There is a Dreadhorde Butcher, but boy, the sideboard here from Andrea Mangucci coming in handy with Leyline of the Void basically shutting that off. Yasharn, which is also in the main, by the way, shutting down basically everything out. That's right, it's a hate bore. And uh, a 6-6 six, six Hydroid Crisis, the perfect size to get in, in the front of Gigantha. And it looks like Andrea Mangucci is going to be able to pick up the victory here over Gabriel Nassif in two games. An absolute nail-biter of a game one. Really swingy, back-and-forth game that was really cool. This one, though, not so much. Yeah, not so much indeed. And and, and it's very clear with Mangucci's build of the deck, both main and in sideboard, that he... um that he came prepared to beat sacrifice strategies. Now, how ready is he for gruel? Eh, I mean, not as much as some other salt type players are, but he might just feel like, Hey, this is not the, that's not the aggro deck that I really care about all that much anyway. So I want to be doing as well as I can against the salt time mirror. And while also having some game against sacrifice. And so he's elected to build his deck in this fashion. And at least in this matchup and in this pairing, it's worked out beautifully. Somebody in chat said this game is boring. Hey, you want to talk about pasta again? <laughs> no, they, they didn't that. spell they didn't spell boring the normal way. <laughs> oh, I get the joke. I get the joke. Maybe we can talk about how my Browns are already down seven nothing to the Kansas City Unbeatables if you want. <laughs> we could do that. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, they scored God. in their first possession. I mean, come on, are you kidding? Who's gonna beat this team? It doesn't feel like anybody. Andrea Mangucci smashing in, getting Gabriel Nassif down to five and earning the good game from the Hall of Famer. A hard fought game one, but game two, that sideboard plan there from Mangucci really came through with Leyline of the Void and then the Yasharn to kind of put the finishing touches and make it so that Nassif just didn't have the ability to do the things that his deck is designed.